so uh, prior to Advent, we had spent some time going through First uh, John together. We spent about 12 weeks, actually, in John's first epistle. And um, John is addressing um, some false teaching that had, had crept into the church. It was causing a lot of, of dissension, a lot of division. Uh, and so John kind of presents some truth there to expose the errors that were um, being presented as well as, as he's exposing errors, it's also exposing who the true believers are. Right, it's kind of like what truth does. It exposes it exposes lies. It's kind of like putting a, a, a flashlight out into a, an alley and seeing all the, the cockroaches kind of go all over the place. Right, and that's kind of what truth does. It it is exposes lies. And so John writes this letter to the churches in Asia Minor, and he is uh, laying out for them. Uh, the truth pertaining to Jesus, the truth uh, pertaining to uh, the way in which the church is to engage with one another. Um, he's addressing the issues of, of false teaching. And um, following uh, that first epistle, we see that John will write two more letters. That's what an epistle is. It's a letter. Uh, he'll write two more letters, uh, second and third John. Um, it's probably written between three and, and six years of, of, of each other, and John is addressing the churches still. And um, as, I, as I kind of was preparing the end, at coming to the end of First John, uh, it was my intention to kind of circle back before we got too far from First John. I wanted to spend some time looking at Second John as well, and uh, if the Lord wills it, next week I want to cover um, Third John because I, f- I feel it's important for us to um, teach through and preach through the Scripture in the way in which it's given to us. Uh, I love uh, expository preaching where we are teaching through the books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, not just the, p- the pieces I like to talk about, right? Um, because that really doesn't matter. I want to I teach it in the way that it has been preserved for us over the centuries and presented to us so that we can have a proper understanding and keep the necessary context um, that is uh, so important when, when reading the Word of God. Um, oftentimes, confusion comes in because passages of Scripture are just presented um, uh, one like, kind of like a crazy eight ball. Like, you know, God, what do you think about this? And, you know, they kind of shake it and there's, there's the answer. And, and it's like, obviously, passages of Scripture will speak to different areas, but that's not the way, um, as Christians, we ought to be learning the Scriptures. Um, I feel that uh, it's my responsibility to teach you to read the Word of God, to uh, apply the Word of God, and learn the Word of God in the way in which it is, give, is given to us. And, and obviously, as we go through that, there's all kinds of topics, um, but it doesn't um, uh, allow for uh, a, a preacher just to kind of preach his, his preferences and his pet peeves and, and all the things that, that are easy to kind of preach through. We want to we address the, the whole counsel of God's Word, right? So with that being said, um, that's why this week and next week, if the Lord uh, wills, uh, we're going to hit um, this week, Second John, and, and next week, um, Third John. And so you'll see as we, as we go through, there's only 13 verses in, in Second John. And so um, I'm going to kind of tackle this a little bit different because I want to kind of tie it in to where we were in First John. And so we're going to kind of look at uh, what John says. We're going to take a moment and, and consider um, how what John says in Second John um, relates to what was said in First John. We'll see some beautiful continuity that's there. And then John will see, uh, addresses the issues of false teaching. And, and I want to kind of take a look and see what we learn from those epistles on how do we respond to false teaching and false um, teachers in the church. And so let's take a look together. If you have your, your Bibles open, or you can certainly follow along with me um, reading uh, 2 John chapter 1. Let's pick up in verse 1. John writes and says, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. I love that. What a, what a, great, um, what a great reality. The truth that is within us, it abides within us. And look, it will be with us forever. Man, we're going to take it with us into all eternity. God's word will never change. It will never end. And so the truth we're embracing now will continue with us because God's word lasts forever. And that's what John is saying here. 
And so in his opening, he's saying, he's saying grace and mercy and, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. Um, it's, it's an interesting opening here, and there's a lot of speculation to, to just who is John addressing uh, in this second epistle? Who, who is this elect lady and her children to whom John says he loves in truth. And there's, there's no clear way of knowing specifically um, uh, all this time out uh, uh, the specific person or group to whom he is um, referring to, but there's likely one of two audiences here. He's either referring to a specific woman in a specific church that had a tremendous influence and was a leader in the church. And so he's addressing her and, and the people in the church would be the, 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 um, the, you know, the children that would make up the congregation. Uh, that's certainly one possibility. Um, much of John's writings are usually intended for a much broader audience as we look at um, uh, certainly the Gospel of John and you know, certainly we look at Revelation and uh, we look at even 1 John was a very broad audience. Um, uh, as we get to 3 John, we'll see it's kind of focused more on Gaius, but um, it, it's a, usually there's a, a broader audience to whom he's writing. Uh, possibly John is writing, um, using that terminology, symbolically addressing uh, the bride of Christ. Uh, the church, um, the church corporately, and the, the children he's making a reference to may be the, the people that are within the church. Now, in the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because we do recognize it was intended for a very broad audience. You know why? Because we're talking about it 2,000 years later, right? And so it's obviously, it's applying to us here, here, here at the moment. And so sometimes the authors of scripture knew that they were writing something that would outlast them. And sometimes they didn't. And, and so, um, but here we are still uh, embracing that. So just an interesting um, consideration. Verse four, he says this. He said, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. We looked at that passage uh, last week when we, we kind of tied in what our, what our, um, one of our values is, is seeing people connect with God, right? We love seeing people uh, growing in their faith and growing in their, their love for Jesus and, and allowing their, their lives to align up with the Jesus in whom, we love, in whom they love. And, and as we, we get to see people growing on their journey towards Christ-likeness, this, it's just a wonderful, it's a value here at the church and certainly it's a value that John points out very, very clearly here. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. He says, now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning. What is it? That we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. It's very interesting. John circle back, circles back to a, a key theme that is not only in his first epistle, um, not only in his second epistle. He'll certainly mention it again in his third epistle. We see it all woven throughout his gospel reading. It's this idea of, of, of loving one another. As we consider uh, him, when he captures the words of Jesus in John chapter 13, Jesus says this, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. It's interesting, I, 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 was, I was kind of you know, read, reading that text and preparing for um, sharing this with you this morning. And, and I thought to myself, this is something I found pretty interesting. When we, when we consider those words from Jesus about this new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another, um, uh, I, it, it makes me think about something that Moses wrote in the book of Leviticus. He says this in Leviticus chapter 19. He says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. God says, for I am the Lord. It's, like, it's really, it's the same way in the same content that Jesus is, is expressing in John chapter 13 and that John is, is, is reiterating in his epistles. But the question that I kind of wrestled with as I came across that is, wait a minute, if, if it's found in the book of Leviticus, which is in the, the first five books of the, of the law, all the way in the Old Testament, if it's all the way back in the, ver in the book of Leviticus, then why is Jesus calling it a new commandment that I give to you? when really it was an older commandment that has actually resurfaced out of, out of Leviticus. And here's what I realized. 
We see in Leviticus that, that Leviticus is the, moral, it is the moral law. It's the way in which we are to, to treat one another. However, what we see Jesus doing is Jesus doesn't introduce a new law per se, but he introduces is a new emphasis, a new way in which this law is to be lived out, a prioritization. He sheds light on that law, and he presents himself as an example of how that ought to be lived out. And we see Jesus doing that oftentimes in regards to the law. He'll say, hey, you've heard that it's said that you shall not murder, but I say to you, if you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. You've heard that it's said that you shall not commit adultery, but, but I say to you, if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you committed adultery in your heart, right? And so what Jesus is doing is he's taking what, what, what uh, was penned by, by, by Moses in Leviticus and, and he is expressing, this is the way we carry it out. And look at it in the full context of what Jesus says here. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Look, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. I don't know about you, but I, I really struggle with that. The weight of that is very significant. Because I'll be honest with you, I don't love anyone as much as Jesus loves me. Sorry if I let you down. Right? I mean, I can't even say I love anybody as much as I love myself. I was trying to change that, but I'm working on it. I got a feeling you are too. But Jesus is saying here, and, and, and again, it's a theme that we see John bringing up often, time and time again, this idea of loving one another and our love for one another is directly connected to our awareness of God's love for us. Can I encourage you and remind you that Jesus loves you? He came for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What motivated the father in sending the son was love. And what motivated, mo motivated the son to go to the cross was love for you and for me. And what, what the scriptures teach us as Christians is that our awareness of that, our response to that is that we ought to likewise love one another. The emphasis and the repetitiveness of this theme all throughout the Word of God highlights not only the priority of love, but love as evidence of a changed life. As evidence of, our cha of a changed life because love does not, uh, is not consistent with the nature of mankind. But it is the evidence of a changed life. And John reiterates the importance of loving one another. And then he, then he circles back to another theme um, of his first epistle, right? He, again, he highlights the importance of, you know, love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. You got it? Okay, now love one another a little bit more, right? And so we see the repetitiveness, we see the priority, we see all that. But then he has another focus that he brings up again in 1 John as well as 2 John, and that has to do with dealing with false teachers, he says this in verse 7. He says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. John returns again to the concern of, of false teaching in the church, and, and he encourages them, Watch yourselves. You can hear the appeal of a father coming through the, the pen of the apostle. He's like, be careful. Watch yourselves. We're going to look again at that as we come more to the end. But I want to kind of focus what he says here next. He says, look, watch yourselves so that you might not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. What in the world is he talking about here? Let me tell you this, what Paul, let me tell you what John is not saying here. John is not referring to our salvation here. When he talks about this, for not, about losing our full reward, this is not referring to a person's salvation because the goal here is a person's full reward. He's saying, now watch yourselves because the goal is that you receive the full reward. And the, the reality of it is that not everybody's going to. And the one who doesn't walk in obedience and doesn't hold the truth and doesn't apply those things, they're not going to receive all of the benefits and all the blessings of the full reward. The goal is the full reward. Now, if that was pertaining to salvation, it couldn't possibly be pertaining to salvation because you either have the full salvation or you have no salvation. There's no partial salvation, right? And so the reality is it's not a, it is not a progressive work. 
It is an immediate work that is accomplished when we repent of our sins and we put all of our trust in Christ alone as the only means of our salvation. And all of our trust is not in our works, but in his work. And so we recognize that that can't possibly be referring, this full reward cannot possibly be referring to our salvation. What is it then, what John, what is it then that John is referring to? He's, he's referring to maturity. He's referring to, to a life of, of, of surrender, to a life that, that, that has the life of Christ being lived out in it. In fact, he, he doubles down, double down, double downs on this in verse 9. He says this just following that. He says, look, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And so what John is highlighting here is, listen, man, we want you to recognize that, that God's heart for you, God's desire for you, is to grow in the full stature and maturity in Christ. It's a reiteration, though, of what he's saying here in, in verse 9. He says it, he says it again in, verse, uh, in chapter um, 3 of, of 1 John. He says, look, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning, look, has either seen him or known him. In short, what he's saying here is the person's Christianity is not evidence in what they say. It's evidence in how they live. Now listen, I, I, didn't, say it isn't, I, I didn't say secured because our salvation is secured in Christ. A person's salvation is evidenced in how they live their lives whether they truly have embraced Christ or not will be seen in their life. Here's the hot question that's often raised. The question is this. Can a Christian lose their salvation? The, the reality of it is that this is the wrong question. This is kind of like the same kind of question like, hey, can God make a rock so big that not even he can move it? The question is not, should, the question should not be, can a Christian lose their salvation? Here's the question that needs to be answered. What is a Christian? Because I can tell you this, that this is not the question that the early church was struggling with early on. Because everybody knew exactly what it meant to be a Christian. They knew what it was to die to themselves, to embrace Christ, to live a life that is, that is, that is uh, pursuing Jesus as the lover of their souls. And for the one who, who, who believes that a person can lose their salvation, I'd ask the question, I'd ask them this and say, listen, is it, do you think that a person who is, who, who's living a life of obedience to Christ who is following Jesus, who is in the word of God, can that person lose their salvation? The person would most likely say, of course not, because they're pursuing Jesus. And my contention is that's the only kind of Christian I see described in the scriptures. Amen. You see, what oftentimes drives the belief, the belief that a person could lose the salvation, and I can understand this, I'll be honest with you, is because they look around at people who profess to be Christians and they act like the world, they prioritize like the world, they live like the world, they sin like the world, they do everything, but they just put a brand of Christianity on it. And you know what? That is a relatively new phenomenon in the last you know, couple of centuries. That's not the reality of what Christianity is. And so unfortunately, this subject has been a real dividing point, but really the issue that needs to be really answered is not whether a Christian could lose their salvation, but what is a Christian to begin with? Because here's how Paul says a Christian looks. He said, I've been, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I, and I recognize I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going I'm to drop the ball along the way, but I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to repent of my sins and I'm going to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. I'm not looking for excuses. I'm not looking to see how close I get, can get to the line. Listen, the whole book of Hebrews is written to a, a bunch of people who had a profession of faith, but not a possession of faith. Biblical Christianity is people who have, a, who, who have, who have repented of their sins, and is pursuing the lover of their souls. And when they drop the ball, they repent of their sins, and they run to Jesus. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God, is what he says. But whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. I think we can reconcile that question. 
by defining what are we talking about when we talk about what is a Christian. Let's pick up verse 10. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, the teaching that John is laying out, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I'd rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. I love this. This is a warning to consider who you allow to influence your life is really what John is saying here. Again, we hear the, the, we, and see the heart of a shepherd in John, his care for his people. And he's warning them to be careful to consider who they allow to influence them. This is not a call to avoid non-Christians. The reality is we're called to go into the world. We're called to be a light in dark places. Jesus modeled for us, right, the goal of reaching people for Jesus. The idea here of letting a false teacher into your house is akin to allowing them into your heart and into your head. It's allowing them to influence the way you think and uh, the way in which you believe. It's allowing a false teaching to influence the truth of what you know to be true in the scriptures to accommodate a culture that teaches otherwise. And what John is saying is, hey, man, if you do that, you're going to be guilty of, the, of, their, of you, you take part in those wicked works. We'll circle back on that in a moment, but I want to I just want to take this, this section here, and I just want to kind of focus now on um, some of the consistencies that we see in both First and Second John. Right? I want to go, kind of go back a little bit, because I know not every, unless, does everybody remember all 12 weeks? Okay, good, so then I'll, I'll circle back there, and because and, uh, uh, I can test you if you want. Um, I don't even remember all 12 weeks, so just to be completely honest with you, right? So let's, kind of, let's just kind of see some recurring themes, because when we see recurring themes, it highlights the importance of priority, right? And it helps us with application, right? It's, it's, it's presented not just to maintain, remain up here, but it's, it's presented so that we can live it out there, right? And so we see some consistent um, teaching in both first and second John that I think we would do well to uh, take note of. We see a prioritization of this, the theme of love and obedience in both first and second John. Uh, we also see it in, in, in John's God. Listen, we see it all throughout the scripture. But we also, but we see a consistency in first and second John on the subject of, of love and obedience. First John chapter five and verse three, John says this, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. I love that because the reality of it is it, it, with love comes obedience. And we need, so many people are so quick to say, I love God, I just don't follow him. Then you do not love him. We do not see any disconnection in the scripture between love and obedience. Again, it's what people present today to kind of make people feel good about themselves. But the reality of it is, the scripture is very clear in saying, if you love God, you'll follow him. Jesus even said, listen, why do you say you love me and don't do what I tell you to do? Right, so we see the theme of love and obedience in, in this first epistle here, and then we see John double down on it again in chapter one of uh, verse six of, of uh, Second John. He says this, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Right, listen, love is an action word. Right? We, we can't say we love God and don't do what he tells us to do. And so love and obedience is woven together, again, in John's epistles as well as all throughout. So we need to recognize that our obedience uh, to God's word should be running parallel with our expressed love for God. And by the way, love for one another. Secondly, we see John focusing on this idea of overcoming the world, the way in which we as believers um, recognize that we are no longer part of, we are no longer citizens of this world, if you will, right? We are citizens of, of heaven. We are a redeemed people of God. And so as new creations in Christ, our priorities ought to be different. Our lifestyles ought to be different. Uh, the things that, that drive us and motivate us ought to be different than the world around us. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, John says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
And I think we need to recognize the many ways in which we allow, the, and I said we, we allow the love of the world to influence our lives. It ought to create a, a, a little bit of a tension in us that, that we take a moment of pause and to consider, God, where are my priorities? Do not love the world or the things in the world. Why? Because the world is passing away. Right? The reality is, as we saw earlier on, the only thing that's going to remain is the truth of God's word and God himself. He says in chapter, uh, verse 2 of chapter 1 in 2 John, he says, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. He'll be, it'll be with us forever. And so the reality of it is, it, it, it's a prioritization of that which will last forever. How much time gets spent on securing comfort in this little window of space called life here on this earth, this little, this little you know, uh, chasm of time, 70, 80, 90 years, I don't know how long it may be. So much emphasis, so much priority, so much worry, so much care. Focus on this little snapshot of time. Yet in light of eternity, it is a speck of dust in all of the universe. As Christians, we rise above that, we prioritize that which is eternal. We see thirdly a, a, a theme of, of the assurance of salvation, God's ability to save, the, the work of Christ being sufficient to accomplish what needed to be, de, be done so that, that man can be reconciled back to God. Chapter 5 and verse 13 of verse John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I mentioned it's one of the biggest themes of what John is presenting here. He's saying that God, listen, God doesn't want you to feel indecisive or unsure or insecure about your, your eternal state. These things were written that you would know that you have eternal life. And listen, my assurance, my security is not based on what I do. It is based on what he has done. And the fact that I know I have embraced what he has done will be seen in the way in which I live my life. It will be evidenced in a life of obedience and repentance. Not perfection, but obedience and repentance. Striving to be more and more like Jesus. Verse 9 of Second John says, whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And again, it is that, it is that idea of the, the assurance of knowing that as we abide in him. I think of John the Baptist who, who you know, the, those, those moments before um, he was carried away to be beheaded. He is, he is in prison and um, for calling out sin in the, in, in the leadership of, 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 of the area. And, and, and he is about to be um, beheaded, and he's in a place of discouragement. And he sends his disciples to go and ask Jesus, go and ask, is he really the one, or should we wait for another? And Jesus sends word back and says, go back and tell him that the, what you see and you hear, the blind eyes are opening, the deaf are hearing, and the captives are being set free and blessed, he, blessed is he who's not offended because of me. We see the humanity of John and we see a godly man who went through a season of despair, of questioning. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I guess my, my guess is there are seasons in your life that you've questioned. And it is in those times that we can be comforted that it is not us who are holding on to God, but it is in those moments more than ever before that it is God holding on to us and he has the ability to carry us through. Whoever abides in his teaching has both the Father and the Son. The, the, the other area of continuity that we see between First and Second John has to do with this area of false teachers and deception. First John chapter 4 and verse 1, John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now what he's referring to when he talks about testing every spirit, he's referring to testing every teaching, right? The, the spirit behind the teaching, right? But testing that which is being said. 
He double downs on that in, 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 uh, in, in his second epistle in verses 10 and 11. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked ways. I purposely saved this last one uh, because I wanted to end our time this morning with kind of circling back what was a, a, a primary reason for John writing these epistles. And, and it was the idea of addressing the, the false teaching that was existing uh, within the church. And what do we, what do, we do with that? Um, we need to recognize that false teaching is not anything new. It goes all the way back to the garden, right? I mean, the moment that, that Adam and Eve were in the garden and the moment that the serpent came and began to twist what God has said was when deception and false teaching entered into the world. And you know what? It has not stopped. Nor has his strategy stopped at all. And until the consummation of all things where, where all of sin and everything that, that is, that is uh, connected to sin will be forever gone and we're in the new heaven and earth, new earth, until that time, false teaching will be present in the world around us. We need to recognize that all false teaching traces its, ba- its lies back to the father of lies, Satan himself. And he seeks to twist and and manipulate God's words, words to, to say things that are inconsistent with what God intended for us to understand. The greatest way that that, that is accomplished is, is when people take passages of Scripture out of context. You've, you've seen it. So have I. There's some false teaching that has absolutely no biblical truth to it at all. Um, those are easy to spot from a mile away. It's obviously, it's, there's no biblical verses uh, that we can ascribe to it, and so uh, we can kind of spot that a mile away. But the most dangerous false teaching always has a little truth and a little scripture mixed into it. Some of the most uh, notable and visible preachers in our world today are really good at twisting passages of scripture to say what he or she wants it to say, which results in bigger audiences and bigger bank accounts. The most dangerous false teaching always has a little truth and a little scripture mixed into it. That's the strategy that Satan used even when he tempted Jesus. Right, you remember in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is, is baptized. He's about to launch his public ministry. And after he is baptized, right, we see the, the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. And we hear the voice of the Father, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Right? And it's at that moment that Jesus heads off into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And we see the enemy coming and, and has the audacity to try and tempt God. And what did he do? We, we see in, in, in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 4 that the devil took Jesus to the holy center and city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, listen, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Look, for it is written, here's the twist, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike a foot against, your foot against the stone. He has the audacity to take the very words that Jesus wrote himself, by the way, out of context to try and get Jesus to violate his own words. His strategy hasn't changed one bit. And so the most dangerous false teachers are the ones who take passages out of Scripture, out of context, to make it say what they want it to say. It's why, again, it's why, why, we, it's why I'm so committed to expository preaching. I think it's a, again, I'm not, I don't think topical preaching is wrong, um, but I think as a, as a steady diet, I think expository preaching really safeguards the health of a church from appreciating and growing in their knowledge of the word of God. And I thought that's, that's the responsibility of the role gifts that are laid out in Ephesians chapter four, to turn people towards Jesus and the word of God themselves. And so we see, lastly, as we wrap it up, a couple of responses that we see from uh, John in his two epistles on how do we respond to false teaching. I don't think we need to spend too much time um, proving the fact that it exists. Um, you, there, it's all around us. And so, um, nor do I feel like we need to be afraid of false teaching. 
And I'll explain to you why that is in a moment. But let's, let's take a look. What are some of the, what are the responses to uh, false teaching? Number one, it's this. Test everything. Test everything. First John chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Don't just believe what someone is saying because they say it eloquently or charismatically or, or they have some kind of a title or a degree on the wall. Don't be impressed with the delivery boy. Test all things. So how do we test everything? We test it according to the word of God. The best metric or the, de- the best commentary on the word of God is the word of God. The scriptures will never contradict itself. And so if we want to understand what a, what a passage of scripture means, we need to look at that through the lens of what else does the scripture say about that. We don't need to rely on intuition or a gut feeling or some prophet bringing it to us. The scripture will confirm itself by itself. It is inerrant. It is sufficient. Everything we need to know is contained therein. We need to consider is what's being taught consistently woven all throughout the text of Scripture? Is it being presented in the context that the author intended? You can make a text say pretty much anything you want if you take it out of context. And as I'm saying this, if you're thinking to myself, well, I really don't know how to do that, that's why we need to grow in our understanding of the Word of God. I pray that it causes a little bit of uncomfortableness in each and every one of us to, to say, you know, to, to recognize, I can't just trust everybody behind the pulpit. I need to wor- know the word of God for ourselves. I think, I think people are going to give an account to God for the amazing um, availability of truth that is made there for us that we don't take advantage of. Test everything and test everyone. Number two, rely on the Holy Spirit to expose error. Rely on the Holy Spirit to expose error. First John chapter 2, verse 26 and 7 says this, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is taught you, abide in him. The anointing that is being referred to here is the person of the Holy Spirit that Jesus made reference to in, in, in John's gospel where he said, I'm going away, but I'm not leaving you as orphans. For the Holy Spirit will come and he will abide not just with you, but he will be in you and he will lead you into all truth and he will bring to your remembrance all of that which I've taught you. And that's why I said before, you don't need to be afraid of false teaching. You don't need to be afraid of of whether you're going to slip into error. As long as you are open to um, stating your your agendas aside and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to bring to your awareness through the word of God that which is true, he has the ability to keep you. Not that that doesn't mean that you don't need teachers. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the role gifts that God places into the church, pastors and teachers, and to, to equip the church to do the work of the ministry, right? But, but here's, the, here's the difference. Listen, you are to be taught by them, but not depend upon them. It's a big difference. You can appreciate me, and you do, and, and you, you make that clear, and thank you. You can appreciate me, but listen, you don't need me. You don't need me. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you. And you know what? He is far more capable than presenting, to to present truth to you in his word than I ever could. He knows you better than I ever could know you. He knows where you're going through. He knows where you're at. And so don't settle for me or any other pastor preacher that you listen to. Benefit from their gifts it's the purpose of, it's, it's what builds up the body. But you don't need anyone 
because the Holy Spirit is in you. And as long as you've got the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, you can't miss. So what does that look like? How does that work? How does that play out? Well, you, you, you've probably had that experience as I have as well, those moments where when you hear something, you're like, yeah, that's just, that seems right. There's just something on the inside that bears witness that, that this is true. Or maybe the opposite's happened, right? You've heard something, you thought, wait a minute. That just doesn't seem right. What is that? It's the Holy Spirit of God within you that's letting you know, test everything. Test everything. There's, there's been times where I have, I have heard something and my first reaction is, that can't be true. And I studied the word a little bit and I thought, oh, that is true. I was mistaught in that area. That's okay. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It gives us that moment of pause. There's other times where I've heard things and I'm like, that doesn't sound right. And yeah, it's not right. That's why it's, it completely contradicts all these other areas. But it's the Holy Spirit that will put a check, if I can use that word, in your spirit that says, no, this, I, I need to dig deeper into the word of God to ensure that that which I'm hearing and embracing and allowing to influence me is consistent with the word of God. Number three, guard who you allow to influence you. Guard who you allow to influence you. Everyone, as he says in verse 9 of, chapter, of, of 2 John, um, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring you this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wickedness. As I said before, this isn't about who you allow in your, head, your house as much as who it, is, who it is that you allow into your head and into your heart. Who do you allow to influence you? Guard the, your, yourself in those areas. As I said earlier, we, we, need, we need to be careful, right? This would, that we need to be aware of the fact that there's false teaching out there. Don't let that Jehovah's Witness, you know, they're so nice and they're so loving and they, they really seem to care about me. And, and you know, don't, don't, don't let them come, in, come into your house and, and sit down and explain to you their theology unless you have a good enough grasp of your own theology and you have a good enough grasp of the Word of God to know why their theology is wrong. Because here's what will happen. If you don't, you're going to be influenced by them instead of influencing them. I'm not saying to avoid Jehovah's Witnesses. I love when they come knocking on my door. Right? But the reality of it is, I'm not going to be influenced by them. They're going to be influenced by me, which is probably why they don't come anymore. Um, but, but that's, we, we need to, so I'm not, we're not talking, listen, we're not talking about avoidance. We're talking about preparation. We're talking about understanding the word so we can rightly influence and be the salt of the earth around us. Number four. When we consider teaching, we need to consider two very important things. Number one, what, is it, what, what does it say about Christ's humanity? What is being said about Christ's humanity? Verse, one of, uh, verse 7 of, of, chapter, of 2 John says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Obviously, this is one of the issues that John was, was dealing with. They were questioning whether, whether God can come and be flesh because they thought that flesh was evil. And so it was a big controversy in that day. There's question about whether God can become man. You see, this, this is essential doctrine when we understand the humanity of Christ. It is necessary to recognize that Christ came and became a human being. Because if Christ did not become a man, then he could not be our perfect sacrifice. And if he was not our perfect sacrifice, then we are still lost and dead in our sins. And so, and so he was not a mystical being. He was, he was not uh, an esoteric being. He didn't become God after he lived a life. He was always man while here on the earth. And so we need to recognize what we say about the humanity of Christ is very important. Secondly, we need to consider what is being said about his deity, his humanity, as well as his deity. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 and 3. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son, anti against Christ, right? No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father 
also. What are we saying here? That Jesus is the central figure of all that exists. He is the central person of all that exists. Teaching that doesn't emphasize Christ is weak at best and false at worst. It grieves my heart to hear sermons today that don't even mention Jesus in it. It's nothing more than than a motivational speech. The preaching of the gospel that doesn't present Christ is not a gospel that saves The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is one who will point people to Jesus. And if teaching isn't pointing people to Jesus, it's not being led by the Holy Spirit. If it's pointing people to a person or a task or a work, it's not the intention of preaching. The Spirit leads us to point people to Jesus. He who denies that Jesus is the Christ denies that he is the promised Messiah come from heaven. As John says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. You can't have the Father without having the Son. But if you confess the Son, Jesus said you have the Father also. Well, John says you have the Father also. You've heard, you've heard people say, hey, I don't have a problem with religion. I'm, I'm, I'm tolerant of everybody. I just don't like the whole Jesus thing, though. Right? It's like, of course that's the problem. Right? It's amazing how in, in an age of everything being tolerant, tolerant, people have the biggest issue with Jesus. They're okay with everything but Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was very intolerant. Listen, Jesus, Jesus was very narrow-minded. Jesus didn't say there's a lot of ways. Jesus didn't say, hey, just give it a shot. Jesus didn't say that, like, like just, you know, just go with your gut. No, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way. There is salvation in nobody else than in Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of other teaching out there that will point to everything but that. Here's the point. Error is most clearly seen in what it teaches about Jesus. About his eternality as God, about his virgin birth, his sinless life, his vicarious death, his glorious resurrection, and our soon coming king, to which Paul writes in Philippians chapter two, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is all centered on Jesus. And any teaching or teacher that gets your eyes off of dying to self and living for Jesus, your antennas better go way up, folks. It's all about Jesus. That's what John's prioritizing. Loving like Jesus, embracing the truth about Jesus, and exposing and running from the lies about Jesus. And I thank God that I'm not left to my own mental capacity to pull that off, but the Spirit of God that is in me and in you will let you know, stop. Look and compare what you're hearing to what you're reading in the Word of God. And let the Word of God be the thing that forms your belief system, not the charismatic personality. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for how it equips us. Thank you for how it um, informs us on how to see you in all that you are. Thank you for how it helps us to see us in all that we are and our need for you. Lord, help us to be lovers of truth. Help us to be hungry for your word. Help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding not just, just so it's mental capacity, mental or, or intellect, but help us to know you, like Paul said, to know you. We give you thanks for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to, to worship the Lord this morning and close out in worship.